I recently had the chance to try out a brand new star tracker called the Move Shoot Move Nomad. This is definitely the smallest star tracker I have ever used. In the past, I have used star trackers such as the original Ioptron Sky Tracker, the Sky Guider Pro, the Star Adventurer, the Astro Track, as well as a couple of other smaller mounts. And this is by far the smallest star tracker I've ever used which should be a major plus if you're traveling with your astrophotography equipment. I planned to use a fairly heavy setup, a Canon 6D full frame DSLR along with a Rokinon 135F2 lens. And this setup was just a little bit over four pounds in weight. So it was not a light setup considering the size of this tracker, but I wanted to see how well it would compare to some of the previous trackers I had used, such as the Ioptron Sky Guider Pro. You can buy the tracker alone for 209 US dollars, or you can get the kit with the laser pointer for polar alignment for 239 US dollars. Or if you want to go with the one with the polar alignment scope, that is 259 US dollars. And that's the one that I went with because I find that the polar scope is pretty much essential to getting accurate polar alignment. You will also need a wedge or a ball head for polar alignment so you can adjust the tilt or the angle uh, of the star tracker so that you're facing the north or south celestial pole and you can buy the polar wedge from move shoot move as well for 90 us dollars or if you already have a wedge from another brand or you have a three axis tilt and pan head you could use that as well i was using my manfrotto pro 405 head which i already had from another setup so i didn't buy the wedge Okay, I've transferred all of the images to the computer now. So let's take a look at them. I'm going to use the blink tool in PixInsight and I will actually zoom in to 200% so we can see the shape of the stars better. And I'll just move forward fairly quickly here. And at 200% magnification, most of the stars look very round. And there are occasionally some that are not great and a few that are fairly bad. So you can see how the image is slightly drifting around. That is not an issue. We're mainly just concerned with the shape of the stars in each image. Uh, now, it's fine to look at it this way, but we can do a more quantitative analysis by using the subframe selector tool. Now I quickly loaded all of these images, which is a total of 96 images into this tool. So we'll look at the eccentricity value. Uh, now what I'm going to do is switch this one over to eccentricity. And so the best stars I have in this image have an eccentricity or roundness of about 0.54. Let's take a look at what such an image looks like. So this is the best individual frame. I'll zoom in again at 200%. As you can see, the stars are pretty much perfectly round everywhere. So that is great. Now, if we look at the worst frame, that is at the very bottom for the eccentricity value, it's 0.912, and that should be terribly trailed. So as you can see, when I zoom into 200%, this frame is very, very trailed. So I have found that with this particular setup, the Rokinon 135F2 with the Canon 6D, uh, stars with an eccentricity value up to about 0.7 look acceptable. Let's open this one up, for example. And then I will zoom in to 200%, auto stretch the image. So as you can see, this is about the bottom limit of what I would consider acceptable. Um, I don't think I would at 100%. Yeah, still looks quite around at 100% actually. But if you zoom into 200%, you can notice some trailing. So now we can select everything that uh, has an eccentricity value below 0.7. So if we do that, we can see that 69 out of the 96 frames uh, would be considered acceptable if we use 0.7 as an acceptable value with this particular setup. Uh, so in total, 71.8% of the images were acceptable, which actually for a small star tracker is actually quite good. So now just a reminder, this was the worst case scenario test. I picked an object that was just, uh, just above the celestial meridian. So it really was a worst case scenario. And if it can track over there, it can track anywhere else in the sky. So this is the object that 
that I had gone with at the time. It had just passed the celestial meridian. Uh, so if we turn on the equatorial grid, you can see that the objects around that area have to travel quite a distance in the same amount of time. So uh, this was traveling quite fast. So if I'm imaging something else closer to the North Celestial Pole or anywhere else, um, I likely get better tracking performance. Now, this is a stacked image of the region around Polaris. I know that there is an integrated flux nebula around this region, and I wanted to see if I could capture it with my Rokinon 135 lens from a dark site. And I was imaging from a Bortle 3 site at the time for a star party. Okay, so this is what the image looks like after some gradient reduction. Okay, there we go. I have taken out the stars and now you can see the starless image. And that is how much gas and dust there is in the region just around Polaris. Uh, that we normally don't see in images. Overall, I'm very happy with how well this little tracker performed. It was easily able to carry my Canon 6D along with the Rokinon 135 f2 lens and a remote control. And while my main setups were imaging other targets, I was able to get several wide field images that I think turned out very, very well. So going forward, this will be the main wide field setup that I'll be using. So the move, shoot, move tracker is here to stay in my astrophotography arsenal. I hope you found that helpful. Let me know in the comments below what you think of this tracker and if you are planning to buy one of these please use the links in the description of this video as that will support this channel. And as always if you have any questions at all feel free to post them in the comments underneath this video. Thanks for watching and clear skies.